guys are going a little Klamath River right now. Well, things kind of got, I got my parts. My wife's actually typing up the parts list. I wrote all the part numbers down for the 8300T power shift. Uh, I actually had a few of the clutch pistons in stock in the shop there, so I don't need to order all those. But things kind of got sideways here. Everybody's getting ready to start harvesting strawberries. It's third cutting hay, which is the final cutting we get here. We only get three cuts a year. And uh, so everything's just absolute pandemonium right now. I'm just, I'm just working my ass off, as usual. <laughs> Uh, still trying to get the Peterbilt done. Uh, I ordered a depth harness with it, depth harness for it, because it, the one that was in there, I'll have to tell you a story about it later, but it wasn't right. Anyway, I've been working on that too. Uh, we're heading out to a nursery that is kind of an emergency type deal because he's got one of these huge strawberry digging machines that they built and uh, I gotta pull the whole rear end out from under it because it's got a seal leaking on it. And it's kind of set up like a, oh, it's kind of set up like that backhoe I showed you where you gotta drop the rear end out from under it and then pull the axles out of it and everything. It's not like a truck where you, it's got hubs on it you can pull it. it it's a different setup. Uh,
Well, it's about five o'clock in the afternoon, and I came here this morning and tore this rear end out and tore it apart. It had a seal leaking on it, and the reason the seal is leaking is because the vents plugged up, and it's kind of an emergency type deal. They didn't notice that really till they. This is their main harvester, but this vent you can't see it under here. It's all plugged up, and this sits on top of the machine. And I was telling the owner there, I said, you know, the reason that it's plugged up, it, or re, the reason the seal went out is the vent plugged up. And he goes, oh, shit, what can we do there? And I said, put a piece of pipe in there and run a hose up to the top of the frame or something somewhere high. Because right here, I mean, all the all the dirt from the star wheels when it's digging plants comes right down on top of it. It's just not a good deal. So these guys built these machines themselves. So, all right, what do we got for parts here? What do we got? That's probably going to be a bearing race. Where are my seals at? What I'm interested in right now. They're all bearings. These must be my seals right here. No. What is that? That's another bearing race. Where the hell's the seals at? Please tell me you got seals. That's kind of. The whole reason we're here. Okay. Ah, maybe they're in here. Here they are. Here they are, Oscar Meyer. Ah, I bet these big bastards aren't cheap. Okay. I figured how I'm going to put that on there without screwing it up. How are we going to do that? Hmm. Tricky. Yeah, this ain't working too bad here. Take the soft part of this handle. Yeah. That's pretty good. need to take it to work. Yeah. I'd like to go down just a touch further. I don't want to hit this edge, so it's kind of a touchy thing here. What do I do? Pretty much there now. Okay, got away with that one. I don't know. Boy, it's kind of a goofy setup. It really is. We kind of made it difficult for seal installation, where you got to tear the whole rear end apart to change the seal. But we'll handle her. Okay, so the next step me to put the bearing on I got my bearing heater let me get a big bearing on there I gotta figure out which one I it's gonna be a small one and a big one it's the other seal it's a bearing race we'll have to change those in that housing right there bearing race got here that's the small bearing. Yeah, that's the small one. Where is the big one? OK. 
kind of goofy it's the you know usually like on a car or truck the inside bearing's bigger this one here it's backwards the outside bearing is the bigger bearing and the inside's smaller probably can vibrate that sucker right on there with my air hammer and just keep on going let's try it well shit or should I <sighs> fucking darkness is creeping up on me pretty quick it'll take a while to get that bearing here warmed up it'll take a while to get that big bearing hot too I think I'm better all right the compressor and let's try it I've done that trick about a million times. What a guy can do with an air hammer, hit it right there on the inner race. You know, don't get out here in the cage or you will screw it up. All right, we're gonna pre-lube that bearing. We're gonna knock this bearing race out of the housing. Well, guys, for those of you that don't know what I'm doing, I'm sure there's a lot that know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to explain it for the guys that don't know what I'm doing. Uh, this, I don't know. Uh, it's not really a trick. If you've been around this stuff long enough, you'll 
it's very very customary to when you got races in place bearing races in places that you cannot get to them on the back side of the race to beat them out um i don't know i it's way we've it, it's better than taking a torch and cutting them out and a torch i mean i just you get more slag and crap down in the hole with the torch you know down in the axle housing than you do with the with the uh, welder but what you do is just weld a bead and i kind of if it's a really wide bearing race i'll weave back and forth to try to get more contact area and i go clear around the bearing race and what that does when that weld cools down it shrinks up and then it shrinks that bearing up it pulls it in and then then you can just usually pop them right out of there but um the, the the bad thing about the the bad scenario that you got to clean you might make damn sure that you get everything i take a bunch of brake clean and air hose and i blow the hell out of that axle housing and make sure and wipe it out and clean it out and make sure there's no metal or slag left in the hole so that's the only drawback to that but it sure beats screwing around there forever trying to get them out with a punch and a hammer Flopped it over and we're gonna weld this one up now. Okay, here we go. Another rod. Well, this would be a good time to talk to you about the Peterbilt, the one we're doing the car uh, engine on. So, I was trying to wire the instrument cluster, okay? So, I got the tack working. I used the tack off the magnetic pickup right off the bell housing uh, that was originally in there. Um, <clears throat> that's one thing Cummins did do right is they left that threaded hole in, in the bell housing for a magnetic pickup. So, anyways, I did that. Tack works on the speedo. We should leave it alone because the output shaft speed sensor is already there. It's got another magnetic pickup on the output shaft speed sensor. <clears throat> so I spent like I mean I stared at wiring harnesses on page after page after page on a the 389 uh, Peterbilt wiring harnesses, and I found Jake wiring, Cruz wiring. And I found like a P130 plug, which I never did find on this harness, a P130 plug that went to, it was using the common, one of the return, one of the return wires was a common for the coolant level sensor and the coolant temp sensor, but it never would show me the signal wire. So I kept looking and looking and looking. Well, the I finally found out, I, I downloaded a brochure from Peterbilt and this is a 2013 and 2013 was the first year that Peterbilt started multiplexing. So multiplexing, the instrument cluster basically, they're going to use a twisted pair of wires, a, a red, not a red, a yellow and a green, a can high and a can low. I think yellow's can high, green's can low. So the way... <sighs> They're using basically the J1939 data link and it receives information from other, the ECM through this data link, through the twisted pair, but you gotta have a can terminator too. So 
Anyways, long story short, the way I was reading through this entire thing with the 2013 Peterbilt's, it, this truck would almost have to have a cab control module. That way, the cab control mo module works in conjunction with the instrument control module to make the gauges work right. So the cab control module receives the information from the ECM of the engine. So then it transmits the information to the instrument cluster to tell the gauges where they're supposed to be. So I'm sitting there thinking that all this through and I was like, dude, we're not going to buy all these other modules and try to install them. That's just, we'd be way, way, way too much time. I think our only recourse to make this effective and, and to make it not last so long and drawn out and let more parts is just, we're just going to have to do it the old fashioned way. The ECM is going to know what the temperature is with the coolant temperature. It's going to know what the oil pressure sensor is. We're going to wire a stop engine lamp and a check engine lamp in there, you know. So we're just going to manual gauge everything. You know, we're, we're going to manual gauge the manifold pressure. We're going to manifold the coolant temp and the engine oil pressure sensor. That's what I decided to do. So anyway, that's I thought I would tell you about that i'm kind of curious to see if some guys got some better ideas because i am willing to listen uh i just didn't want to get this guy's got so much money into this thing already and i was really trying to avoid having to go trying to find a whole different cluster and then trying to figure out how to make a cab module communicate with this and back with the ecm and do more wiring and i mean you're talking hours and hours and hours of wiring and and more labor to an already crazy ass project you know so anyways i thought i'd let you guys know about that scratch the seal ride with that so I'm gonna be really careful. Yeah, that turned out good. 
need to clean this up any here. Or... Kind of a ridge here, a dirt or something. Better clean that up a little better. I didn't realize it had quite a ridge like that. Uh, don't swing it into my brand new seal. Damn it. Damn it, Jim. Got to get a little 90 weight, prelude that bearing.
see. We gotta unhook and then planetary reset's gotta go on. Now this thing had this shim right here. You know, and I don't have, I told Mike, I said, I don't have any information on this mic. I said, no, hopefully, you know, our, hopefully stuff doesn't change on us here. You know, I'm just going to put the shims back in it that were in it. And after I put new bearings, I just hope nothing changes. That's what, and, and he said, I understand we're putting you in a bind here by, it's kind of an emergency. They're getting ready to harvest and they just noticed this thing. And so we're kind of taking a chance here. <laughs> If you're really doing this, you really probably want to, you want to make sure that the, I'm not really sure how they're setting the preload on these, to be honest with you. There must be a rolling drag or something, I mean, here on this axle. But it's got all these shims here, too, that go in it. I'm trying to figure out how are we going to go about that. Do we set them all here, or do we grease them and stick them on that? I'm thinking we grease them and stick them on. Well, no, that ain't really going to work very good. Man, I don't know. I was looking for a way to pick it up with my crane, and I don't really see a way to get a hold of it. I can't get a strap through there. That's a great big bastard, too. Let's see what I'm going to be able to do. I'll have to hear about all the... Guys, tell me how to spin the back up. I gotta get it on here. Screws me up there a little bit. Well, what made the plus even just do it and be done with it, I guess. And there it is. God, that's something that's pretty heavy. Okay, well, I had to tighten this. This down now, and then uh, I got to pull the ring gear off. <sighs> Be lucky, I'm gonna get this one side done, and I'm gonna have to come back tomorrow and flip it upside down and do the other side. We got to be real careful when we probably just pull that vent out of there before I smash it and hook it all up. And I lay it down because sometimes when they like to roll down, you don't have a lot of control, they just kind of roll on you. Uh oh, that's not good. Okay, that's that goes there, and I will grease that. I'll grease that in here. It goes around that bolt. Okay, I see. And I will put a bunch of grease right here and then I'll stick to that one. Because this will, we'll flip this upside down and put it back on. I got marks here to line the halves up. The halves and the half knots. My daylight.
sorry guys, I'm pushing hard trying to not get dark on me.
Okay, guys. Down there. Bolts in it and half an hour picking stuff up in the dark. We'll head home and come back early in the morning. And got to flip it upside down to the other side. I can't control that. Alright guys, just so if you come in the video, well, I didn't even know I was going to video this thing this morning, but I gotta, I'll show you, I'll show you what it come out of, I'll walk through the shop, well I didn't, you guys know what it come out of because you saw me pulling it out, this is a strawberry harvester, is what it is. It's a great big bastard, but they got salsi tracks on them. Here's one of the tracks over here. And this is one of the tracks over here. Pulled off. Here, I'm standing here. That's how big the track is. About the size of a combine, a big combine. Well, I am come back in the morning so well thanks guys for watching i'm uh well 